The name of this series is called I Made a Difference. And every year, kind of let you know how I think, every year we spend a little bit of one of our series focusing on one part of our vision. If you know anything about East Coast Believers Church, we have a three-part vision. It's go reach people far from God, which, which is why we exist. We, wanna, we decided a long time ago that we weren't just going to have a church that existed for the church. We were going to have a church that made a difference in the lives of people. We just want as many people as possible to know him. Right, everybody? And so that's, we, we did that. And then, but because we do that, we also wanted people to grow in their relationship with God. The second part of our vision is grow in your relationship with God. And how do we, like God loves you so much that he'll take you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. He wants you to grow in your relationship with him. And so we do that through a couple different ways. We do that through our small groups. This is where you get some really intense Bible studies and you get some people that can help you settle yesterday's issues and so you can find some freedom in your life. We do it through our grow classes, which we disguise as a membership class. It's a four-week four week class we offer during our services and encourage everyone that's part of East Coast Believers Church to go through that. What's really unique about that is the third week of that four-week process we, we help you discover your, your gifts. We help you discover how God uniquely designed you because we believe in your design, you discover your purpose. And so we want to help you discover your purpose. And then lastly, we want to give, go grow, give, give our lives to the plan of God. And that's preparing you for that ultimate day where you stand before Jesus and give an account for your life. And that's really what this series is all about, that you would give your life to the plan of God. So you could say, I made a difference with my life, that I didn't take up just space on planet Earth. I didn't just suck oxygen on planet Earth, but I made a difference. So one day when you leave this earth, because one day you will, and you give an account for your life, you can hear the words that we all want to live for, well done. And uh, I joke, we don't want to hear the words, well, you're done, I'm glad. And we want to hear, well, well done, you know. And, and so we, we've been going at this for four weeks now, we'll wrap it up today. Here's our, our, our theme verse, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on. It means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Notice this phrase, study how he did it. Like, find out the way Jesus did it. Because, here's how he did it, he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. And every once in a while, I have to have a series that brings us back, and that's what this series is, because we live in a culture, we live in a society today that keeps trying to bring you back to start thinking about yourself and just that this is all there is to this life. There's nothing more. And I have to have a series that reminds you once a year that, hey, there's more. And here it is. And this is our thesis. There's more to life than this life. You have to recognize this is not all there is. But we live in a culture. We live in a society that's trying to get you to think this is all there is. There's nothing else. There's nothing more. There's just, there's just your 70, 80, 90 years on this earth. And get all you can. Can all you get. And sit on the can. And that's what it tries to get you to do. That this is it. There's nothing else left. And I'm trying to remind you that, hey, there's more to life than this life. That you're going to leave this planet one day and you're going to live in eternity. And that's what this series has been all about. And I want to show you a picture. I ran across this picture this week, actually, this Tuesday. And this is a picture of a $10 bill. And this would look like a pretty worn out $10 bill. I wouldn't even say it's a normal $10 bill. But let me tell you the story behind this $10 bill, which makes this bill so special. I have a buddy of mine in, in here, and um, he and him and his wife, out maybe, maybe six, seven years ago, came to me and said, we want to do something that makes a difference. And so uh, we're going to go down, and we're going we're gonna to go find homeless people that live on Lake Eola, and we're going to bring them peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, um, and a fresh pair of socks. And I think they started off with bringing maybe six or eight or 10 sandwiches down on a Saturday morning. And they had, they had to go find these people. And then over a period of time, it grew, word got out. 
it grew and it grew and it grew to ultimately they were bringing out, bringing down 200 sandwiches on a weekend down to the homeless population and bringing them a fresh pair of socks each week. And they became known down there. Well, this one Saturday, my friend found someone and he went to go bring him a sandwich. He goes, no, I don't want one today because today's my birthday. Today's my birthday. In fact, today I want to give you something. And he reached in his pocket and he gave my friend Robert a $10 bill. And he said, it's my birthday. I want you to use, and this is, I want you to use this $10 bill and I want you to use it to make a difference in someone else's life. And my friend said, no, 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 no. I'm here to help. He goes, no, let me tell you my story. He goes, before I was homeless, I was doing okay. In fact, when I went homeless, I had money in the bank. And I had enough money in the bank that I thought I'd be okay on the streets. But as you find out, if you don't have an income, that money you have in the bank runs out quicker than you think. And he goes, I got to the point where I had no more money in the bank. And he goes, and my worst fear came upon me. What am I going to do for food? How am I going to eat? He said, and I, I went into Publix one morning. And I was going to do something I never thought I would ever do. I was going to go in there and steal a rotisserie chicken and run out the door so I could have food for the day. He says, but on my way in, this lady stopped me and said, sir, I don't want to bother you, but I believe God told me to give you this and he gave him a $10 bill. So I didn't have to steal. So here it was sometime later, my friend was down there and he said, here, I wanted to give you this $10 bill so you can use it to make a difference in someone else's life. To which my friend didn't use that $10 bill he put it in his wallet and the, slid it underneath in a special spot. And it serves as a memorial to him today. And I'm hoping it'll do the same for you. That there's more to life than this life. Because life does something. It tries to get you to think that this is all there is. But there's more to this. Psalm 112 says it like this. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will, be nev will never be shaken. It's not that you won't have anything going wrong in your life, but the things that are going wrong won't shake you. Then they will be, here it is, this is what we're doing. They'll be remembered forever. The Bible says what you do for God will be remembered forever. What, how you serve God, how you live for God, and how you make a difference in the lives of other people, the Bible has a way of recording that to make a difference. That's why, like for example, the month of December, we got together with our team and we said, okay, we're going to call this the month of joy. We've been working on this since last August. And we're going we're gonna to not just have a few services to celebrate Christmas and celebrate Jesus. We're going to throw a month-long birthday party for him, for him. Can I tell you why we're doing this? It's because we want to do something that will be remembered forever for our Jesus. And so it starts the, actually this week, this week. Wednesday night is our first, first Wednesday. We're going to have a Christmas concert here. We're bringing in a special band. Laura Cook and her team are coming in, a world-renowned recording artist. That's really, I mean, I'm just telling you, if you've ever been to a Christmas concert, this one will be different than, it'll be someone you want to bring people, a concert you'll want to bring people to. Just be incredible. But then the whole month, for the next three Sundays, we're going to have a special series just to reach people who are far from God. We're going to wrap it up with, with uh our, our snow fest, which is this Saturday, December 21st. And we're bringing, you know, you ready for this? 98,000 pounds of snow to come in. We're going to have big, long snow slides for the kids and tubes and play areas from the have snowball fights and make snowmen. And all you people from the Northeast can't believe we're going to do this, but we're going to do it. And um, it's going to snow in Florida. And then we're going to wrap it up on Christmas Eve with multiple services here in all of our locations. And here's what I'm telling you. We're doing all of this not just because we're having a snow fest, not just because we're trying to be cool, because want, we want to do something that'll be remembered forever for our Jesus. What I'm saying is, is this, is on that Christmas Eve, when we do all those services, hundreds of people, I'm telling you, are gonna give their hearts to Christ in our services. And when they lift their hands, Heaven's going to record that. How do people ask me, they say, Pastor, well, how, do, how does East Coast Believers Church, how, how do we do stuff that makes a difference? I just kind of wanted to just let you in on how I think and how we do things here. And there's pr 
several different ways. How we operate and function as an outreach East Coast Believers Church is number one, we have five different lanes that we run in, five different things that we do. Number one is through our Sunday services, East Coast Believers Church. We decided to build a church that the unchurched and those far from God would want to come and would love to be here. And that you could come any way you are with your problems. No one's going to call you out. No one's going to care how you dress. No one's going to care where you sit. We don't want anything from you. We want something for you. We want to have amazing children's and youth ministry. We want to give out free coffee. We want to be generous. We're not trying to get money from you. We just want to love on you and bless you. This has worked for us pretty well because as of now, for 2019, are you ready for this? We have seen a little over 1,500 people give their hearts to Christ at our services. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and, and if you counted first service this morning, 1,507, right? And so, but then there's something else we do. We do it through another lane as our local missions. This is something you might see, you might not see us do this as much, but we give a percentage of our income to local missions. That is, we support local uh, organizations around here. We don't do what they do. We come alongside and serve them. We partner with them. We don't try to replace them. We just want to come help. Hope helps. Christian help. And, uh, you know, like for this Christmas, for 350 families, we, brought, we help provide Christmas for them and fund that. And last weekend, we sent out 3,000 boxes from Samaritan's Purse to kids all over that would not have Christmas. And we just come alongside and we serve them that way. Here's something else that we do is national missions. And people, what, what does that look like, national missions for East Coast Believers Church? That's where we, we help plant churches. We've done a very aggressive approach to this. We've helped plant as many churches as possible throughout the United States. And, and then you allow me, and I want to say thank you for this, because about 20% of my week is involved in coaching and helping other young pastors. And I just want to say thank you. Oftentimes I'm able to sneak out of here on a Monday and come back on a Thursday and just go work with local churches. And you guys allow me to go do that. And I want to say thank you because you're helping make a difference. And a lot of churches and a lot of pastors that would quit and give up. And because of your generosity and because of the way you help them, uh, they're not quitting. And they're not, do you know today, there, there are literally right now 3,000 pastors a month quitting ministry. And we just want to come alongside some of those 3,000 and tell them, hey, we need you on our team. We need you serving. And so that's how we do that. We coach and we help. We also do world missions. And this is something you probably don't get to see much of that we do, but we give away around so far this year, around $300,000 to do this. And that is we reach missions, uh, people all around the world. Of course, you know about our home in Guatemala and all the things we do there. But beyond all that, we're doing a whole lot more. We're in Asia right now helping plant churches. We're in, we're in parts of the world where they don't even know. People haven't even heard of the name of Jesus before. They don't know if the name Jesus or Coke, what the difference between them are. And we're reaching aggressively into those areas and those arenas right now. And because of that, like we just recently picked up a new, a new partner, partner, a couple from our church that are moving over to the Amazon. They're not going to go move in the Amazon. They're going to live on a city at the base, at the mouth of the Amazon River, where about uh, 30,000 workers come in and out every quarter. And those 30,000 workers, we're going to reach them. These are Indians that would live way like in the interior of the Amazon forest that we could never get to. They don't have a word for the name Jesus. We're going to start a church there and help them and partner with them. And then those 30,000 are going to come. We're going to reach them. They're going to take that gospel and go back into the interior of the Amazon. That's what you're doing. We're supporting works in Iran right now. Do you know right now in Iran, 50,000, I can't tell you all the details of it, but 50,000 people a month are getting born again in the nation of Iran right now. And you're part of all that. And these are the, this is things that you don't always get to see that you do, but I want to say thank you. And then lastly, I have one more and this is an announcement more. I know it's a holiday weekend to get this announcement. Uh, it's probably not the best timing, but I'll talk more about it at the beginning of 2020. But God has been dealing with me and God has really been, been really encouraging me and challenging me to focus the rest of my time in ministry and building up and raising up young adults to lead, to raise up another generation of leaders and to say, you guys can take the church further than we've ever dreamed of. And so I got a huge announcement to make. In August 
of 2020, we are going to start, are you ready? East Coast Bible College right here in Orlando. And it's going to be a world-class Bible college that's going to raise up and train up young adults and leaders, and we're going to do it. It'll be part-time for them, but we're going to do it the three, three different ways. There'll be biblical study, leadership training, and practical hands-on training, and we're going to provide and build up world-class leaders for the body of Christ right here in Orlando. More details to come, but coming August 2020. I'm excited about that. And what does all this mean? What does all this mean? Here, here's what I look at this. I, I, the picture that I see is this. I could, I norm, I couldn't do any of these by myself. I would need you. And I don't think anybody here sitting here today or watching, you could do any of these by yourself. But what it does mean is this. Together, we are a whole lot better than apart. And together, we can change the world together. But God has been good to East Coast Believers Church. God has been good to this, to this family here. And I, we've, we've seen success. I can't even believe, I'll be honest with you. I can't even believe that I would even attend a church, let alone pastor a church, that would see 1,500 people get saved in a year in their services. But with, guys, with great blessing comes great responsibility. When the hand of God is upon us, we have to respond to that some way. So I think it begs the question, and here it is, what does Jesus require of me? What is God asking of me? What does he require of me with all the blessing in my life and with all the goodness he's poured out? The hand of God is truly upon this church and the hand of God is truly upon you. What do you do with this? Romans chapter 12 says this, beloved friends talking to Christians, what, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you, somebody said, I encourage you, surrender yourselves to God to be a sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes, here it is, your expression of worship. We think worship is singing a few songs. Maybe if you're really radical, you clap or raise your hands. But that's, that's, that's an expression of worship. But you know what the Bible calls worship? Is when you surrender your life to him and say, okay, God, my response to your goodness is I'm going to use my life to make a difference in the lives of other people. So someone says, well, how? Come on, pastor, tell me how. Because I, I want to know what God requires of me. And I think there's really three things. We, we say it around here. It's real simple. Number one is that we pray, is that we get involved in prayer. And the, I, I'm just letting you know, I need your prayers. This church needs your prayers. Your family needs your prayers. And can I tell you this? You need your prayers. If you knew, like prayer should not be our last response, our last resort. It should always be our first response. If you, if you knew what was on the other side of your prayer, you would pray more. Like, there's almost always a miracle on the other side of your prayer. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 9. He said to his, his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Here it is. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Like God's saying, ask him. Any, any great leader, I'm looking at a great leader over at my friend here, Jeff. Any great leader who's touching people, the first thing they'll ask is prayer. Because you know what prayer does? It gets God involved. And we can have all the strategies and we can have great music and we can have great, great snow fests and concerts and get great good, good messages and all that. But if God's not involved, we're just entertaining, we're not changing lives. Amen, everybody. So, so we, we want to pray. Our response should be, okay, God, pray. And it, can I say this to you? We need your prayers. I'm asking you to pray for your church, pray for your pastor, pray for the ministries, the outreaches, all that we're doing. In fact, we take it so serious that I, we, we want you to come out and pray with us. We call it First Saturday Prayer, the first Saturday of every month, which is actually coming up this Saturday from 9 to 10. If you've never been to an all-Saturday prayer from 9 to 10, it's just a really incredible one-hour time of prayer, some worship. We pray. It's just great to see corporately what we do. And, and for the Lake Nona family, let me tell you, we've been inviting you to come down to be part of our prayer services in Oviedo. But I got a great announcement for you too. You guys are one year old down there in Lake Nona. So starting January of 2020, you're gonna do your own first Saturday prayer in Lake Nona. Isn't that awesome? Come on, that's great for them. Second thing we can do is this, is we can, we can give. We can give. People say, give what? Well, here's what I will tell you is this. 
God never asks you to give what you don't have. He's not asking you to give what you can't give. He's just asking you to give. And our, our response to what God requires of us is to give. Now, if you go to East Coast Believer Church, you've been here for any length of time, what you know is this, we don't make a big deal of this. I made a vow to God when we started East Coast. I'm not gonna beg. I'm not gonna manipulate. I'm not gonna show emotional videos to get people to give and, and, and do all this. We're just gonna ask people to ask God. Because I figure if you ask God, God will talk to you. And if God's talking to you and you obey God, everything will be okay in the end. And it's just work that way for us. So we don't make a real big deal about this, about giving, but just all I'm asking you to do is ask God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, here's my point. A stingy sower will reap a, a bigger harvest, but the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving, here it is, let giving flow from your heart. Don't let it become a, not from a, a sense of religious duty. He says, don't give because you have to. Don't give because if you, if you don't give, God's gonna get mad at you. Give because, here, are you ready? Give because you love God. Give because you wanna honor God. Give because you wanna use your life to make a difference in the lives of other people. And people say, well, how do I even start giving, pastor? Here's my suggestion to you. Start with a percentage thought. Okay, God, I'm going to give this percent to you every, every time I get increase in my life. The first 10% or whatever, that's called the tithe. The first part belongs to you. It's called intentional giving. And when you get later on in life, I promise you one day you'll thank me. When well, you don't just give because what's left over, you give God the first. That's called honoring him. And it's not because of religious duty. It's because you love him. Here's the third thing you can do, and that is Go. Someone says, what do you mean go? Because sometimes we want our pastors to go, we want our staff to go, but can I just tell you, God wants to use you to make a difference. And I wanna encourage you to go on a missions trip this year. To consider, if you've never been on a missions trip, to go on a missions trip. I want you to consider joining a team. I want you to consider being part of one of the teams that makes a difference in the lives of other people. In Acts chapter one and verse eight, he said, but I promise you this, Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be seized with power and you will be my messengers in, to Orlando, throughout Florida, the United States, even to the remotest parts places on earth. In other words, like I'm just saying to you, we have multiple mission trips you can go to all around the world this year. Plan on going on one. We make them as affordable as they possibly can. If you're not able to do that, the very least, be part of a team that's making a difference. I come here early in the morning and I'm always blown away when I get here on Saturday, Sundays and you have coffee teams that are making coffee. You got media and production teams that are here, children's teams that are setting up. You got facilities and maintenance teams and special events teams and youth teams and they're all running around here, scurrying around here and they're doing and making a difference. There are people right now that are on cameras. There are people in another room over there, about five or six of them. They're mixing TV shots and they're doing production work back there right now so we can get this broadcast all over and they're doing it because why they want to make a difference you know why because they're his messengers you know what the reward is here's the reward last Sunday I got an email or a text or some form of communication was sent to me and uh, it got to me and I read it and it was a person they said pastor you know when you gave your count I want you to add one more to that count because on the way home, my grandson was driving home with me and he said, Grandma, I didn't raise my hand in there, but I prayed the prayer and made Jesus my Lord. That's someone's grandson. You, 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 you know why they go? They, they go because they wanna use their life to make a difference. Which, if we're gonna pray, if we're gonna give and we're gonna go, I think we all buy into that. And I, I was thinking about how to wrap this up in the next 11 minutes I have with you. And so I put this thought in and I, I put it in this message and I took it out and I put it back in, I took it out. Because if I was probably preaching this in almost any other nation of the world, I wouldn't have to make the statement that I'm getting ready to make. And let me set this up for you. Because I, I think we all buy into wanting to make a difference. I think we all buy into the fact that we want to get to heaven one day and we want to hear, well done. 
We want, I think we all buy into the fact that we want Jesus to be proud of us. Everybody wants our Redeemer and God to be. I, I think that's not a problem for us. I think here's the problem. We, we, we live in a culture today, and this is why I have to preach this series for four weeks. We live in a culture, we live in a society today that says, hey, think about yourself first than everyone else if there's anything left. Don't think about other people first. We live in a culture today that says, hey, I want to make a difference, but I don't want to sacrifice. Right? Like, I, I want to make a difference. I was preaching a few weeks ago, and um, I was supposed to get on an airplane and go preach at another church and, and, um, on a Saturday, which had, been, which had been a brutal day for me to get on there early in the morning and go preach and then hop back on a flight and come home and preach here. And so, but they said they got this new thing, and so they set it up for me. I sat right here on this stage. And I had a fake audience out there. They had cameras on me. And I was able to preach in another church without even going. I thought, this, how good is this? This is amazing. But we see, we, we want to make a difference, but we don't want to change anything. And this is a result of our culture. It's the truth. You, 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 you want breakfast at McDonald's? Come on, I want my Egg McMuffin. It's been 45 seconds already, people. You know what I'm saying? I go to Starbucks, what? You're gonna take me three minutes to get my Frappuccino? We, we don't wanna wait that long. And so here's a statement that, that I put in, I took out, I put in, I took out, but I'm gonna say it anyways, here it is. Anything of eternal value requires earthly sacrifice. I mean, if you wanna make an eternal difference, here's the warning. It's gonna require someone to say, I have to sacrifice something. I think Jesus describes it best when he tells the story. And this is a story you all know. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And in Luke chapter 10, here it is. Jesus answered their question by telling the story. He said, there was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went on, went off, leaving him half dead. And it says, luckily, in almost like a sarcastic tone, Jesus is using here, almost like he's just using a little sarcasm. He goes, well, luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, the priest angled across the other side, so it looked like he, was, he didn't see him. And then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured, injured man. But a Samaritan, which is a Without going into it, this is almost like there's a lot of racial tension there and there's some other things going on. Like he shouldn't have been. The Levite and the priest should have been the one reaching him. But there was a guy who shouldn't have been traveling down the road, came on him. And when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him, which is like period. Like that's where we would all stop. But then Jesus said something. He gave him first aid, disaffecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him up onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly? The religious scholar responded, Jesus said, all right. You go and do the same. Which Martin Luther King Jr. preached a message. If you ever read any of his messages, I encourage you. Like you can get them right now online or just, just Google them. But Martin Luther King was a brilliant preacher, a brilliant orator from the next previous generation, probably one of the greatest speakers that our nation has ever seen. And, and Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did a message on this. And he, and he said, when I read this, and only as Martin Luther King could do. He said, when I, I wish I could do like he does, but I can't. He said, he said, when I read this, I have to ask myself two questions. I, he says, I am forced to reconcile these two questions in my mind when I read this. He said, number one is this. If I stop and help this man, what will happen to me? Like, if I'm going to do this, what will happen to me? It'll require sacrifice. It won't be easy. It won't be convenient. And then he said this, but if I don't stop and help this man, what will happen to him? What will happen if I don't stop? Which begs us, how are we gonna go pray and give 
Is it going to cost us? Yes. Is it going to require something of us? Yes. I just told you the what. Now I'm coming down to wrap this series up with how. How do you do this? How do you live this type of life where you make a difference? How do you live a life like a, with a legacy mindset, with a mindset that I'm not living just for the here and now? Five minutes, here we go. It's going to require three things of you. Number one, it's going to require faith. And when we think about faith, we think about just what you believe. But you know, faith, there's this another side of faith. It's not just what you believe. It's you see something other people don't see. I love this verse in Hebrews 11 and verse 7. It talks about Noah. It says, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He saw something that nobody else saw. He obeyed God who warned him about things. Here it is. That had never happened. And sometimes, like it takes faith. You got to see what other people don't see. I remember... I have my friends, Fred and Claire, in the front row. They're with us in the middle school. And I remember in our one-year anniversary, we were in that little middle school. And I remember, I don't know what happened. We were in our one-year anniversary, and I stood up, and I said, you know what I see? We had about 50 people there. I see a church. And I just started talking, and they, in fact, they got it on, on video, and they played it. We moved into this building. It was like a 10-year-old video. And they said, and I got up and said, I see a church where the lost love to come. I see a church where it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, you, you're welcome at our church. I see a church with world-class youth and children. I said that when we had six kids in our youth ministry. Uh, I, I see a church with world-class youth, world-class children. I see a church where miracles are popping. I see a church where the word of God God is preached boldly. I see a church where the Holy Spirit is not duct tape in a back room, but he has freedom to move and flow and change people's lives in our services. I see a church where the lost can't wait to come because they're not judged or condemned. I see a church that's not a white church, that's not a black church, it's not a Hispanic church, it's not a Latino church, it's not an old church or a young church, it's just the church. I see a church where a preacher's not famous, the music people aren't famous, where Jesus is famous and God is exalted. I, sometimes it takes faith to see what other people don't see. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what faith is. I love this verse in Ephesians 2. It says, that, come on, that's plain enough, everybody, isn't it? You, you're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. Here it is. He's using us all, not, not the pastors, all of us, not just the leaders, all of us, irrespective of how we got here. And I, because people say, well, can I, I haven't, can I just tell you, the only difference between me and you is I got here a little bit earlier than you did. All of us got issues and all of us got challenges. All of us got struggles in our lives. Some of us have just been a part of this a little bit longer than other people. Come on, we're, we're, we are not a museum for saints. We're a hospital for sinners, everybody. And, and, and this is, he said, he's using us all. And what, and what he is building, he used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. Now, here it is, everybody, he's using you. You're the ones he's using, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all, all the parts together. Like, you've heard this analogy where someone walked up to this, these, these three men building, building a building and they walked up and he goes, what are you doing? He said, I'm just laying bricks. He said to another man on the same project, what are you doing? He goes, I'm building a wall. He said to the third man, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a beautiful cathedral for my God. We're not, we're not just serving in different areas. We're building a house for God. We see it all taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God. All of us built into it a temple in which God is quite at home. Number two, it takes intentional generosity. And I'm not just talking about money here. It takes intentional generosity. It takes intentionality if you want to make a difference with your resources, with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Psalm 112 says it like this. They share freely and they give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence 
and honor. And I, I think sometimes we miss this. We think that sometimes when we give or when we do something for God, that sometimes we think when our, when our check or our, our gift leaves, leaves our hand, he leaves our life. But our, what we do for God never leaves our life. It's been recorded by him. I was, we were talking about this this week in our small group with some men. We were just sitting around talking. We kind of got off topic and started talking about this. And one of the guys there, man, just a great guy. I just got to know him a little bit this year. And, and he said, we were talking. He said, you know what? He goes, I, 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 I get that because I, I, I think of generosity sometimes as just being random. He goes, I never thought about it being intentional until I've gotten this series, but doing it on purpose. And he said, I was at the car wash and I got like a $5 car wash. And when the girl was done wiping off, drying off my car, he said, I looked in to give her a tip and I had a 20. I felt like I was supposed to give it to her. So I handed her a $20 bill tip to which she, she chased him down and said, sir, sir, did you mean to give me 20? Because your car wash was only little and you, he says, yes, I did. To which she said, thank you. Tonight my baby is going to eat. Sometimes I don't know if we know we're making a difference. That's why I love these random acts of kindness cards. I encourage us on the way out today, grab a stack of these over the holidays. And you see someone in line at McDonald's, buy that, buy their meal and give them this card. A little something extra to show you that God loves you. You go out for lunch today, like leave a big tip. And when they come back to you and say, you, did you mean to leave that? Say, yeah, I meant to. It's a little something extra to show you that God loves you. It's a story that I tell and it's, it's if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard this story before, so forgive me, but it's so powerful and impactful. Maybe you haven't heard this. We do water baptism services here and we do them in service Sometimes we do them out, 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 out in the parking lot. But every year we always hold one at the beach. It's my favorite one, and they probably do it because I want to do it there. And I like the beach baptism service because when you go out there, it's a public location. And so we have teams of people that work on it for a couple months, and there's a lot of effort that goes into it. I mean, a team of probably 20 or 30 people have to be involved in setting it up and organizing it. We've got to get photographers a special lens to go out there. We've got to have probably what's over and done with over 100 people serving on that event. And then we usually water baptize between 50, 80, 100 people when we do one of those events, if you've ever been to one, it's pretty cool. People come into the, what I like about it is, is we, before you get water baptized, you, you hold a bullhorn, bullhorn up and you say, my name is Norm in front of the whole beach. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and I am not ashamed. People are clapping for you. You run out in the water, they dunk you and you come out, people are clapping again. And what's really cool about this event is what I like about it is every year, bar none, people that come up to the event start watching us and they say, hey, I want to get water baptized too. They don't even go to our church. And we walk them through a salvation experience. Then they get water baptized. Like, how cool is that? But here's the story that I've told before. There was a lady there one year that was walking down the beach. And as she told the story, I woke up that morning and I decided, I made up my mind. Today was the last day that I would be alive on planet Earth. Today was the day I was going to take my life. And so she's going to go like walk on the beach. I'm like, at least go to Disney World before you do that. But uh, she's going to walk on the beach. And she's walking. And she comes across these rowdy people clapping for people. Coming out of the water, getting baptized. She stops and she just watches she comes up to someone and says, I need to get baptized. To which they, she said, do you have a relationship with the Lord? She says, no. I didn't even know. I, I believed in God, but I didn't think about a relationship with him. And they walked her through this relationship. Salvation, prayer, surrender. She goes right out and puts one of the shirts on. He goes right out and gets water baptized. Well, two years pass. She's in the hospital. She had to go to the hospital for something. And a nurse 
comes to her and says, are you a Christian? She says, yes. He goes, can I pray with you? She goes, yes. He goes, do you go to church anywhere? And the lady goes, yes, I do. I go to East Coast Believers Church. And the nurse goes, wait, wait, so do I. To which the lady goes, wait, wait, well, I kind of go. She goes, I live in an, another city and I watch online every week. And so if you're watching, this is your story. She told the story how she was going to commit suicide. And she was going to walk the beach one last time and go home and be done. Except she ran across a group of rowdy people that loved Jesus. She gave her life to Christ and God healed her heartbroken heart and she's still alive today. What I'm saying is, is I'm just letting you know those good deeds of that team of about 100 people that worked that event that set it up and leave early and do all the work, their good deeds will be remembered forever. Which leads us to the last thought, and that is this. We have to recognize that this is our moment and this is our time. I'm reading a book. It's a secular book called Atomic Habits. In this book, and it's, it's a thought that we all know, too many of us put too much emphasis on yesterday's issues and we put too much hope in tomorrow's future and not enough emphasis on what today can do what we can do today what we can do now like what what we could do in two th- December 2019 for our Jesus we could leave this decade taking with us the greatest amount of souls in one month the East Coast has ever done because we're going to have a month of joy for him. You know what I mean, everybody? Here's a verse. I use it so much in this series, I'm sorry. But it's just a verse that's right now so alive to me. It's speaking to me so greatly. Here it is. It says, be very careful then how you live. Not as the unwise, but as wise. Why? What is wisdom? Make the most of every opportunity because the days are, are evil. And what my hope is if you do this, here's my hope, is that you can say, I made a difference. 